understand that many of you are regular users of the library, so I hope I'm not um, being too basic about this, but I'll just give you a brief rundown of what the manuscripts collection here at the library is about. It's one of the major special collections at the library, and our brief is to collect non-government uh, unpublished records, and in particular personal and family papers, records of organisations such as businesses, um, welfare organisations, churches, um, and many others. We also are a place of deposit for some public record office or material the public record office um, has dealt with, and I'll talk about an example of that later, but primarily we're to do with non-government unpublished papers. Um, the collection was founded, or it, it first, we first collected manuscripts in the library around about the 1870s, and some of the early acquisitions included the records of the Burke and Wills expedition, and uh, the letters from Victorian pioneers and other papers of uh, Charles Joseph Latrobe, the early um, superintendent of the Port Phillip district. And over many years, uh, the range of things we collect has changed. In, the, in, say, the early 20th century, we collected things like autographs of famous um, people, and then we moved on to records of pastoral uh, properties and so on. And from, but from about the 1970s onwards, we've broadened out a great deal into collecting things to do with all sorts of people, a very wide range of people um, who have in some way a connection with Victoria, whether they lived or worked or uh, came from here. The, um, I wanted to describe to you today a, a few tips for finding information about people and their occupations in our collection. And you can think of it as looking for specific people or of also finding out not so much about a specific person but about what it might have been like to engage in a specific occupation. Um, and I think it's important to know also that manuscripts should always be used in conjunction with other kinds of material uh, such as books, pictures, newspapers and maps and as, as well as sources held by other archival institutions and libraries. Because it's all part of building up a picture of, of what you are researching. Um, the collection is open to pretty much everybody, except school students, really. But um, family historians are very welcome to use our collection, and I'm sure many of you do already. Uh, we have an online catalogue, which well, well, we always have some backlog. Most of our holdings are catalogued online, and you can search that on our website, which, and I've already forgotten to move the slides on. I was warned that could happen, so sorry about that. So here we are. This is our fairly new logo here. Um, and the next slide will give you our, no, I don't think, sorry. But our website is www.slv.bic.gov.au. Um, but as well as our online catalogue, there are ways of digging deeper into what we hold and in, in the manuscripts collection, including our descriptive lists and indexes, transcripts and digitised material, which are all core, core parts of activities. Not everything is online and there are many works in progress in particular to do with digitising and transcribing. We've really only, um, really only started in a sense but I will show you some key things that may be of interest. The way digitising of resources has developed here and it's been going on for about 20 years is complex. So there, there are, I suppose, um, examples of different ways we've done things over the years. I'll show you some, some of the variety of ways you can search for things in the collection. So my first example is one you, you may know of already. First of all, I'm just showing you the home page and how you can use the, the drop-down menu to select manuscripts as an option if you want to limit your search to specifically that type of material. 
And the first example I'm going to talk about is the, the Bendigo petition, which was a, a petition presented by gold miners in 1853 to uh, Latrobe. There are already rumblings about conditions for miners on the gold fields uh, even a year before Eureka. And this petition um, emerged, actually found on a tip, I believe, in the late 1980s and uh, was given to the library in about 1989. <clears throat> and several years later, we, one of our volunteers indexed uh, the names and sig or signatures on the petition, of which there are thousands, and in some cases they also state the person's occupation. Now many, much of the time that says that they're diggers, which is fairly obvious I suppose, but at other times it tells us that they were storekeepers or some, some other thing. So the, the slide currently shows you how to narrow your search just to look for that specific item, the Bendigo petition, and limit your search by manuscripts and click the search button. The, that will bring you up a list of um, search results and the, the petition is the first one on the list. And because it's been digitised, there's a thumbnail image of it within the uh, entry in the list. If you then click on the title of that item, it takes you into the, the catalogue record with a more detailed description of the petition and from there on the right hand side you'll see a small box in which um, you can get to the digital images by clicking view online and there we have the um, first page of the petition where the actual text uh, of the petition delivered to the governor is is indicated and on the left hand side you have a, a menu of the images. There's actually only about 10 images and at the end the index which I'll explain later. But um, just as an example of one, one the, the petition I should say is an enormous document with many pieces of paper uh, stuck onto a, a huge long piece of cloth it's a very fragile item and we don't get the original out very often. So we've digitised it so you can see what it looks like and, and the images go through it from top to bottom. We can't really digitise the whole thing in one image. But I'll just show you one... I'm not sure how well that's turned out. But you, oh, that's just the angle I'm at. But uh, you can see the many pieces of paper stuck onto the, the cloth and some of the variety of paper and the signatures and so on that, that are on the petition. And here's a, a um, close-up. Once you go into the zoom, you can see some of the signatures closer up and closer up still. You can download the images with the, the box at the top of that page and it will deliver you a TIFF image, a high resolution image. But they are large files so uh, you may need to wait a little while to, for it to download. As well as the images there's the index compiled by our volunteer. This, because this is a, an early example of our um, indexing and transcribing activities, it, it's quite a difficult tool to use in a way because the index, while it, you can get into the names, it doesn't relate back really to the images of the petition. So if you found a name of interest, you really have to search the images to try and find the signature. If you want to see, you may want to verify the signature with other documents that you have to see if it's your person. Uh, if you have a great deal of trouble with that, please get in touch with us. We, we do still have the original notes that the volunteer did and she worked from the microfilm version of the petition and her notes indicate which frame of the microfilm each signature is on. So while it's a bit of work to do it, we can um, retrieve that box of notes for you for you to work through. But unfortunately the digital 
um, resources are a little bit primitive in that way. Maybe it's a project for the future for us to match them up a bit more. But you can see here the um, parts of the alphabet, but if you click on the part of the alphabet you're interested in, it'll take you into a list of the names and you can see that some of them also have their occupations as diggers or storekeepers and various other things, but by no means all of them. So it can be a useful resource, but it can also be a bit disappointing in that you may not be able to identify whether a particular name relates to uh, someone that you're interested in. If it's a common name, it may be difficult to work it out. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about is an example of where, even though we can't relate this to a specific individual, you will get a lot of valuable information about what the life of a gold miner was like in the 1850s. This is a diary we purchased about six or seven years ago and of an anonymous, there's no name on it at all, it's an, it's an anonymous diary by a Scotsman. We, we can work that out from some of the things he says in the diary, but we have no name. But nevertheless, it's an extremely useful tool for finding out what daily life was like on the diggings in Ballarat in 1855. It covers only five, five, six months, sorry. Uh, now, that's the catalogue record for that. And this has also been digitised. And the menu enables you to move between the, the document, that is the images of the document, and the transcript, which is also online. And here's an example of a page from the diary. And the other page on the other side. And here he's describing uh, what it's like working on a wet day in, the, in his hole with his, with his mates. And there you have the transcript of that same passage in the diary. And here's another passage a few pages earlier, which leads me into my next example. Our anonymous digger tells us that he purchased some copies of a document called The Digger's Ten Commandments at, and, and sent them off in letters to his, his folks back home. This was a humorous document that was circulated widely around the gold fields. And uh, several years ago, we purchased a um, manuscript of it. There may well have been many manuscript versions of it, and it was also published in the newspapers of the time. But it's, uh, even though it's a humorous document, it does give you a, a sense of what the goldfields were like. And I'll just read a very short extract from that so you'll get the flavour of it. So it's set out as if it's the Ten Commandments from the Bible. So commandment number 10 is, Thou shalt not shepherd but one hole at a time, nor covet thy neighbour's gold, nor his claim, nor move his stake, nor willfully take washing stuff, not thy property, nor wash the tailings from his sluice's mouth, nor in any way molest him in his claim. And it goes on in that vein much of the time. So that's quite a nice light-hearted example. The next one, just briefly, is the diary of Thomas Pearson, which is another detailed Goldfields diary, which another volunteer has transcribed recently for us. And you can see that one online as well. You can see the thumbnail images along the left-hand side of the screen. And there's a, an index to that, just a brief summary of what's in that diary, which we have digitised and is also available through the, the box on the right-hand side of the catalogue screen. This is because it's an older list, we've made a PDF copy of it. Um, but I'll show you later on an example of the more modern style of listing that we do. This is just um, from the home page. Under the tab called Search and Discover, there's a lot of resources you can use for various purposes. 
And no, I'm not too good on this. No, I might get rid of it. Here you see the La Trobe Journal, which is the library's in-house journal, which is a very valuable source of information about the library's collections. And Thomas Pearson's diary has extracts from that in an old issue. If you go into the digitised early issues of the La Trobe Journal and search for Thomas Pearson, you'll find extracts from his diary there. I'll move on now to uh, Joseph Jenkins, who was a Welsh farmer who came out to Victoria in 1869, leaving his family back in Wales. And he spent 25 years in Victoria before returning home in 1894. Welsh was his first language, but he was keen to practice his English and he kept detailed diaries of his life in Victoria largely in English for those 25 years. And although he'd had his own farm in Wales, out here he was a swagman, an itinerant labourer working in the farms of central Victoria. He had a lot to say about the way that um, farming was done in Victoria, not very flattering about a lot of it. Later on he settled down in Malden and worked as a street cleaner for the council there for about the last 10 years he was here. So those two occupations are quite... You can get a sense of what those occupations were like in some detail from Jenkins's diaries. This is an example of um, a system we've had for a while of creating both parent and child records. This means that... And I'm showing you the, the list of search results if you search for Jenkins in the catalogue. Uh, that The first entry is for the parent record. That describes the collection as a whole. So it describes the 25, the collection of 25 diaries. But each of the volumes also has a child record. It describes that volume specifically and has the images for that volume attached to it. And, and those are the ones further down the list with the thumbnails um, beside them. Am I running rapidly over time? I think I may be in. OK. Um, so that's the, the parent record and the child record. And an example of Jenkins's handwriting from the digital images online. The transcripts for Jenkins are still a work in progress. We've transcribed 15 of them, of the 25, but they're not yet edited sufficiently to put online. If you are interested in reading any of those, please get in touch with us. And you can do that by sending us an inquiry to our Ask a Librarian service. On the home, library's homepage, up the top of the screen, above the search boxes, you'll see um, Ask a Librarian. If you click on that, it will take you into the um, mechanism for sending us an inquiry online. There's an online inquiry form and that's what it looks like. If you fill out the details and send it off to us, we'll try and help you with that. We generally have about a two week turnaround uh, for answering inquiries. My next example is the diaries of Alexander Goodall I think this must be one of the most enjoyable things I've done in my years at the library. And it was the first manuscript that we actually digitised here back in the year 2000. And we, we, we created it as an online exhibition. Uh, the library wasn't digitising manuscripts material and adding it to catalogue records at that stage. So this was a sort of standalone project. But it gives you an idea of what it was like to be a young man who worked as a telegraph office clerk in the 1890s. And from the catalogue record, there's a, a uh, link to a archived website which is on Pandora, the Australian archi website archive. And you'll find the, the Goodall exhibition on there. And 
That's the page where you can click to view the various diaries. There's four volumes covering 1893 to 1897. And here's just one page. You can see the delightful illustrations. And he's describing how he got a, a pay rise. And he says, I've got a rise in screw today. Some lots of terminology we don't use much these days, but they're very interesting and charming diaries. The next example is another clerk, this time a bank clerk called Donald Sutherland, a Scotsman, as you can imagine, who uh, worked in banks in various parts of Victoria in the 1870s and 80s. And his greatest claim to fame, perhaps, is that he went to Glen Rowan on the day of the capture of Ned Kelly and described it in his, one of his letters, which we have digitised. Um, and this is a screen on the... Oh, I might not make this my last example, I think, because my colleagues are needing to speak as well. But the... You can actually search the transcript. So if you put in the word Ned, it'll do a search and come up with a portion of the transcript text with the word Ned in it. And here's just a, a glimpse of his handwriting as well. And there are quickly other things that we, other things you can get into on our website. The Australiana Index will lead you into such things as the coal collection of hotel records, which is based on, as an index of some material housed in our manuscripts collection. And it's just an example of how you can search the Australiana Index and come up with a record for a particular person who had a hotel in Melbourne in the 1840s. There are country hotel volumes as well, which we're about to release into the Australiana Index very soon. The other major thing I wanted to mention to you is the Sheriff's Office Index. The, uh, uh, there's a large collection of material offered to us by the Public Record Office of warrants and writs from, mainly from the colonial period, but up to the 1930s, which were not required for retention by the Public Record Office, but they were offered to the library to, to have if we wished to. And we felt that they were of interest, probably to family historians. And it's, a, it's about 250 archive boxes full of them. And so far, our intrepid volunteers have indexed the first 50. And online, you can find our Again, via the catalogue record for the Sheriff's Office, you can get into the research guide, which then leads you into the index. And there's just a one page of... It's an Excel sheet, basically, that it's been done on. And our aim is to update this, um, so, uh, this index from time to time. And many of the people who... Um, had encounters with the Sheriff's Office, have their occupations listed as well as their addresses. So it can be quite a useful resource for family historians. And I think maybe I should move on to my colleague Sandra at this point. I'll just forward. There's a few examples there of the documents you find in the Sheriff's Office. go through oh, yep. there Sandra thank you very much thank you Shona and Anne for that introduction uh, I'm going to really just be building on what Shona has been talking about, but um, probably in a slightly more abbreviated way. Um, it's only an overview. I need to stress that if you hear a name 
or something of interest in the next 10 or 15 minutes, have a look on our catalogue and, uh, and follow it up there. It's just an attempt to display the scope of our collection and encourage you to think broadly and to, to go to our catalogue and make use of it. I think some of the things that we talk, we, we have in the collection help to flesh out the bare bones of um, names and dates and events. One of the collections I really wanted to talk about, and again, this is a very brief overview, is the Pharmaceutical Society of Victoria. And I was partly drawn to this because um, my mother used to swear by a chemist in Essendon, Mr Brocci, and he's actually on this page somewhere. I forget now where he is, but anyway, he's on there. Um, and my mother lived in Pasco Vale and used to get out of Glen Burby Station. She had a recurring skin condition and she absolutely swore by a prescription he made up. She found the um, pharmacy extremely creepy. This was in the 1940s. But she continued to go there um, for her prescription. And there is indeed an entry for Mr Brocci in the membership register of the Pharmaceutical Society of Victoria. Um, the membership register covers 1922 to 30. And the collection also um, contains lists of students that attended the Pharmacy College of Victoria, lists of apprentices, files on selected pharmacies and pharmacists, and poison registers. I only found that out quite recently in the collection. I was quite intrigued to see that. Um, in terms of Mr Brocci, Mum's pharmacist, the register gives his name and address and the date he was elected as a member. And it usually includes details as to whether they resigned, died or lapsed. So that can be quite helpful too in tracking down details about someone you're interested in. The pharmaceutical students list is also particularly interesting because it tells you what they studied Chemistry, botany, practical chemistry, I'm not quite sure what the difference is. And it also includes details of medical, dental and veterinary students who attended the same lectures as the, the pharmacy students. This is a photograph from their um, album of pharmacists, which is approximately 1870 to 1910. Um, it attracted members from as far afield as New Zealand. And I'm afraid the album is strictly dead white males. There's no females to be seen in it. But we'll rectify that as we go on. Now, I'm sorry this, this is quite brief, but we're moving on now to um, trade union records. We hold quite a few of those. Uh, concentrating on the Victorian branches of them. One is the Australian Federated Union of Locomotive Enginemen. Uh, we have records from 1882 to 1930, which include minutes and record books. And it's important too to realise um, that there's related, often related material in other archives, as there is in this case. Melbourne University archives um, have some records of the um, locomotive engine men as well. Just quickly, I'll mention Trove, if none of you are familiar with it. It's an Australia-wide search engine and very useful for picking up all sorts of things, but in our case, for our purposes today, picking up um, archives in uh, various institutions. And this is just an example of an illuminated dress, very popular um, at the time. We've also got the records of the Federated Brick, Tile and Pottery Industrial Union. 
and we've got minute books detailing their activities, photographs, correspondence, and so forth. And this is just um, a photograph of their executive in the mid-1960s. 19, uh, but we're going to cover now, we're going to talk about women briefly and moving on from the, um, the labour movement. Um, we've got the papers here of Muriel Hegney. And Muriel was a very interesting woman. She was initially a teacher uh, before starting work for various trade unions. She used to prepare briefs for arbitration court hearings. Muriel had an ongoing concern with working conditions and equal pay for women. And this image of Muriel is from the library's Riley Political Ephemera collection. It's not held in the manuscripts department, uh, but it is a rich source of information for labour historians, and it is chiefly political ephemera, printed ephemera. Um, for a later period, late 20th century, early 21st century, we hold the papers of Mary Owen, another woman with similar concerns. She was heavily involved in the women's electoral lobby and was a social welfare researcher for the ACTU. Her collection is very extensive and offers details of what it was like for a, a, a union representative at that time. And she wanted to ensure that school students, I don't know whether this was unusual or not, but she wanted to ensure that uh, secondary students were prepared for the workforce when they started out in part-time jobs and for when they moved full-time into the workforce. She wanted them to be aware of their, um, of their rights. So she's quite an interesting um, person in that respect. Also, just to give you an idea of the scope of the collection, we have some um, records of some police officers which give a flavour of their everyday activities. Um, probably the most well-known one we have um, are the scrapbooks of J.M. Christie, who was known as the Master of Disguise, and John Frederick Piggott, a prominent detective of a slightly later era. And here we have um, a young Mr. Piggott and a slightly later one of him closely identifying, um, examining a skull. Um, Piggott was actually the detective involved in the um, Gun Alley murder, um, which Kevin Morgan wrote up several years ago in a book and found that the um, man who was hung for the crime actually was innocent. So I don't think Piggott did such a crash hot job in that case, but in any event. <laughs> uh, on a slightly different note, uh, still within the law, I hasten to add, we hold the memoirs of a prostitute, Ursula Antony, who worked in Germany and Australia. Uh, we also have a letter from an unidentified sex worker outlining the various services provided, again, all within the bounds of the law. In terms of... We, we often get asked what we have in terms of the arts, and we do indeed have representations for music, theatre, literature and art. We've got the papers, for example, of Peter Carey and Sonia Hartner, two people who make a living from their writing, which is not particularly usual. We've got papers of a lot of artists, including Sybil Craig, Moya Daring and the Victorian Artists' Society. This is a page from the Victorian Artists' Society and it's their membership register, 1936 to 41, and you can see the names of Albert Tucker and Violet Teague on this page. We've got the papers of George Coppin, a 19th century uh, theatrical impresario, an actor, and much more recently the papers of contemporary actors um, Anne Scott Pendlebury and Malcolm Robertson. Particularly Malcolm Robertson's papers, very useful not only as an actor but he was a, directed extensively as well 
on the Victorian theatre scene. Very quickly, I'm conscious of the fact Lois is um, up next to talk about Coles Meyer. We've also got the um, electorate office papers of a number of politicians, including John Cain, Pauline Toner, and John Button. Now that's really all I've got time for, so I'd like to hand over to my colleague Lois, who's going to talk about the Coles Meyer collection. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to show you the library's digitised records of Coles. This was a joint project between the library and the Coles Supermarkets Australia Proprietary Limited. Coles Supermarkets Australia funded the project to celebrate the centenary of St George J. Coles opening his first store in Collingwood in 1914. The library acquired the Coles Meyer archive in 2000 and 6,000 items relating to, the, to Coles have been captured and published on the library's website. To find this resource, you go to the library's home page. Hover over research and discover and then scroll across and find explore our collections menu. Click on Click on Popular Digitalised Collections and then scroll down the page until you find the records of Coles Meyer. Click on this icon and you will see here that the records have been grouped into five different themes. Coles staff, Coles stores, brands and advertising, Coles in the community, corporate history, retail history and Coles family. I will show you two themes in more detail today, Coles staff and Coles stores. Select the words Coles staff and here, here you will see that the staff records have been grouped by photographs and other materials. When you select the photographs, you will see that the photographs have been grouped by decades. Let's select the 1930s, 1970s actually, let's jump a few, a, few more, a few more years ahead, and we'll have a look at image 12 in this list. So let's view that, and you'll find, I don't know whether you remember, the downpour in Melbourne in 1972, and this is the staff at Coles number 2000 store, which is now where Target is, and you can see them using their in barefoot and using the brooms to push the water out the door. You can return to the coal staff menu by closing the image in the top right hand corner and then by the arrow key. Let's look at the other material category. Click on the words and here you can see that there are two publications on the history of Coles cricket and some staff retirement dinner menus. Let's have a look at one of these menus. Now we'll have a look at the Coles staff journals, Coles & Co and newsletters. These publications document company information, staff movements and social events from 1928 until 1986. I have chosen to show you the front cover of the Coles & Co Journal of October 1957, which is the finishing line of the M M Mobile Gas Rally. Now let's go back and have a look at the other theme that I mentioned we talk about today, which is the Coles stores. You will see here that these, have been, these records have also been grouped into two categories, photographs and other material. Now let's select photographs. And here you will see that the photographs have been grouped by state or territory and then metropolitan and regional. Whoops, I better show you that. There you go. Let's explore how you can search for a specific person or place. 
return to the explore selected digitized library collections and select and select collection records of Coles Meyer. And let's and let's look for a specific person. I don't know this person, and maybe she's in the room today, but probably not. Her name is Elaine Buckley, and, as, and we select that as an exact phrase. This search has resulted in three relevant matches. Let's look at the first result from Coles & Co of March of 1974. Eileen is found under the news from Store 200 Melbourne and I quote, another traveller was Elaine Buckley Drapery who during a weekend trip with the Richmond, well, we wouldn't want to go with the Richmond Supporters Club but we won't go there, <laughs> visited Australia's famous casino but unfortunately did not break the bank. Now these staff journals are a great resource because they are all, all the text is searchable. And the other thing that's also searchable is the books, the pamphlets, and the descriptions of the photographs. So you can, so you can search for anything, that anyone, any, any place. Anyway, let's move on. And now we'll search for a particular place. And in this case, we're only interested in photographs. So, so, the, so the thing to remember here is that we use still image as one word. And I've selected Croydon. So if we look at the results that we have for Croydon, we have 16 results. And we'll have a look at number one. And number one, you can see, is a, a, the crowd gathered for opening day in front of Croydon store number 206 in 1955. And here is the downloaded version of that particular image. If you would like any more information about what I have spoken about today or seek more information about the Coles, Mark, Coles Meyer archive, you can refer to the library's research guides. And this shot was um, taken before actually it was launched. I only launched it this morning with, with great assistance from Katie Flack. And it, you can now find it alphabetically, so you'll be able to find it under the sea, which is probably roughly about there, if I'm right. Now, to finish off, I'd just like to show you two more Im images. This is Christmas Trading Day in Perth, Perth number store 146 in 1958. And then the last one I'd like to show you is a staff portrait of store 12 Melbourne in 1928, which is now, of course, the location of David Jones' men's store in Burke Street. 